Pound notes come, pound notes go. Mm. I didn't expect that Matchroom was ever going to be one of the biggest sports promotion companies in the world. Don't be ridiculous, I come from Dagnum. What are you talking about? One of the most powerful men in world sport. He's delivered more excitement than any other promoter. One of those larger than life characters. I'm playing a game. If you want me to be posh, I can do it. If you want me to be a roughhouse, I can do it. You're always looking for an advantage. 1%, 2%, 3%, 5%. I knew early doors that I was no academic, but I knew that if I put my mind to something, no one could beat me. I bought a chain of snooker halls. But then I found out that God had other plans for me. Suddenly BBC were wall-to-wall -wall live snooker. And then this tall ginger kid just knocked on the door one day. Oh, hello, my name's Steve Davis. Can I play one of your competitions, Mr Hearn? Was there ever a moment when you thought, I've made it? I have that moment every morning of my life. I walk around and I go, Bazza, you have bang at it, officer. I'm untouchable. Now, Barry, we know you're world class mm. at many things, mm. but are you world class at retirement? Because this is your no. second attempt and your first one 40 years ago, you feel abysmally. I am trying so hard. I, I did try in 1982 to retire, and that was, but I was only 34 then. So I had about six weeks of just, I thought, what would I like to do with my time? You know, you try and analyse yourself. And I thought, I've always wanted to do more fishing and play more golf and play more cricket and things like that. So I just did every day. And after six weeks, I was climbing up the wall and I realized there's something else in my life, mm -hmm. which is that entrepreneurship spirit yeah. of adventure, going into the unknown, building things, creating things. So Matchroom was, was formed in 1982. The concept was just to have some fun, really. I mean, I didn't start it. You know, it's an interesting thing. I, if you start off saying, I'm gonna make a load of money, you never do. Mm -hmm. It's a wrong principle. You can start off saying, I'm going to do something that's in my spirit. You know, maybe I have a calling to do it. Or maybe I just want to have some fun. I want to roll the dice. And you don't put any pressure on yourself in terms of, I've got, I've got to establish a PE ratio of what. That's all rubbish, you know. Yeah. So just go out there and be yourself. And if you are destined to be successful, the good Lord will probably make you successful. Yeah. But if you start off just with one short-term, narrow approach of, I want to make a load of money, you'll never make any. Well, you've got to have a slightly flexible approach because let, let's sort of take it back to the beginning. Yeah. Seven-year-old seven Barry, yeah. born and bred in Dagenham, mm. uh, council house family, working class roots. Your dad's a bus driver. Your mum used to clean the, the, the pansy houses at the top of the hill. Yeah. You had one aspiration, one aspiration only at that time, and that yeah. was to be a heavyweight world yeah. champion boxer. I know. What went wrong? I found out I couldn't fight very well. <laughs> so it was a bit of a career setback. <laughs> I don't know why, because none of my family boxed. My dad was only five foot nine, weighed nine stone, dripping wet. So he was tiny. My mum's family was quite big. I yeah. ended up being quite big. I think I used to go to Saturday morning pictures and sit there and watch Pathé Hughes come up with like Rocky Marciano and yeah. people like that, and my heroes. And uh, I think it just appealed to me mm -hmm. because, you know, kids don't, kids even born poor don't really know it. I didn't know we were poor. I didn't know that. I didn't know that people had indoor toilets. <laughs> or, or, or that, I thought everybody used cut out newspaper as toilet paper. You know, it wasn't because that's what we did, and we were surrounded by love. So you know, what was the problem? It was only when you started to get a little bit older that you realised pe other people have got things you haven't got, and I wasn't jealous of them. I just wanted the same or, or better. So when I saw these heroes on the in black and white screens, and he said, I want to be one of them. So I would listen to the HEP fights coming in from America late in the night with my little transistor underneath the bedclothes, so my mum and dad didn't hear. Mm -hmm. And they became my heroes. And I thought that is the way that you get. I, the question was, how do you get out of this environment that you've been born into and that you're happy in? Yeah. You know, that's a big thing. There was no chip on my shoulder about, oh, I've been dealt the wrong hand. <laughs> no, because you dealt the hand you dealt. Yeah. Don't don't mess about with it, um, but it doesn't stop you wanting things. It doesn't stop you wanting to improve. It doesn't stop you wanting to expand. And you, as time goes on, you see the big houses on top of the hill where my mum cleaned. Mm -hmm. You think, oh, I want one of them. Mm -hmm. Later on, you go back and you buy the whole hill. Yeah, that's that's really sweet because even then you're governed by what you know. So what I was looking to aspire to. Yeah. Perhaps wasn't that much really in mm -hmm. the bigger picture. 
But at that time, it was a massive move. And then I started thinking, how do you, how do you actually get there? And of course, the heavyweight heroes at the time, boxing's always been a working class sport. And people change their lives through it. You know, yeah. it's a risky fight. You look at all the great fighters, they come from very poor areas. Yeah. And they, they achieve. Sometimes they need help to achieve, which is what we try and do. But they have the opportunity to change their lives through sport. And the bigger picture of that is what's inspired me from day one, the idea of having some sort of God-given ability mm-hmm. and developing that and changing your life and the legacy is changing your family's lives and maybe changing your communities and maybe changing your country and maybe changing, like a Bill Gates would say, maybe we can change the world. Yeah. Now, you know, I'm probably stuck at number three of those, yeah. looking at my own community where I came from. But it gives you a great deal of pleasure as well because you start to reevaluate what is success and what is money for. Oh, you know. and, and ultimately, the end goal has been sat here, age 74, yeah. two, two beautiful women mm-hmm. recording a podcast. But, but I, feel, I feel as if I've cracked it, really. You you've, know. you've won the pool. You said, how long have we got? And I said, a fortnight. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking forward to the pool party. Later. <laughs> but, but on a serious note, you well, one of the things that struck me when I read your book, which is fantastic, mm. by the way, is when you looked at those houses up the hill, mm. you didn't just think one day, even from a very young age, you thought, what have I got to offer that yeah. those people need? You yeah. know, you took yeah. action, whether it was babysitting, whether yeah. it was washing cars, you were making money straight away. And yeah. uh, I, I sense that you got a lot of that from your mum because you lost your dad at an early age. Yeah. He was 42 when he when yeah. he had the heart attack. Yeah. But your mum had always been a bit of a driving force. Despite her, very much so. her, her working class roots, she was very keen for yeah. you to evolved to the extent where she was booking in for elocution lessons. I know. Amateur she was a, I society. think she was a working class snob mum. <laughs> you know, she did have this attitude that, you know, even within our street, I think she felt she was better than, you know, and our family had to be better. And obviously she was very, very passionate about her children and pushing them, you know, and you want. I mean, she, on, on every level, and I look back, and at the time, I, don't, I, I thought, you know, you didn't want to hear, you know, when you're 12 or 13 years old, you don't really want to go to elocution lessons. <laughs> you don't, I mean, I was in Bertolt Breck plays and Shakespeare plays on the Amateur Dramatic when I was 14. <laughs> and people used to take the mick out of you, you know, from your area. But that's where the boxing comes well, in. Well, I, le- I, I learned to look after myself a little bit. But more importantly, I learned confidence. I learned the ability to speak, to relate to people. Yeah. And I learned the, the sacrifices of learning your lines and small things like that that made you a better business. I mean, I ended up on the Verse Speaking Appreciation Society, touring schools in Essex, reciting Robert Graves and things like that. Yeah. Why? Because my mum told me to. Mm-hmm. And that's why when she came home when I was 12 or 13, she said, when you grow up, you're going to be a chartered accountant. And it wasn't a question of, I didn't even know what they did. I just said, yes, mum, because yeah. that was what I was used to saying. And she said, you know, the reason for it, the man whose house I clean said, you never see a poor one and you're not going to be poor. Amazing woman. Yeah, sadly missed. Yeah. Sadly missed. But she'd be looking down. I think I might have told you she was a great woman, but she was a snob, a terrible snob. And she still couldn't quite believe it. So she never saw the level to which the company's grown or we have grown as a family. But she did come to Maskell's Mm -hmm. when I first bought it in 1982. And she looked around it, and you've got to understand where she came from, you know? And the only thing she could say to me was, are you doing anything illegal? She couldn't believe that you could do and acquire such a changing atmosphere, such a changing asset. This house is enormous. It's 12,000 square feet. We didn't have a garden. Mm-hmm. You know, we had a washing machine out, you know, a dryer outside. We didn't have, a, at first, we didn't have an indoor toilet, you know. And she came up to this mansion, and all she could think about is, oh, he must be doing something illegal. <laughs> and I said, Mum, I'm, I'm not, because chartered accountants make terrible gangsters. Yeah. But what I brought with me was a mixture of her dreams and my work ethic. So I knew early doors that I was no academic. I was never going to be a genius. I was never going to be 
I don't know, a Stephen Fry, a, you know, wonderful words and poetry and prose. Although I'd acted in the in the plays, but I knew that if I put my mind to something, no one could beat me, because I would go further at any level than anyone else. And that's really what drove me forward, because that inability to accept any type of defeat. And actually, even when you failed, the ability to compartmentalize your failure into a part of your brain that you flush down the toilet. So you learn it, you've absorbed the learning, but you don't ever remember it. You don't ever take notice of it. You don't ever admit to it. You have to position yourself in a position of strength or your enemies or your competition will use that against you. Has it? I, I was wondering, because you play down, I think, your your business acumen, really. Mm. Does the kind of working class Baraboy persona help to disarm your enemies? Totally. Don't get too smart. Yeah. No, I'm saying to you, because you got too smart there, because you're absolutely spot on. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't like people to know that. So, you know, now they do. But, you know, no, you don't. Don't you dare. Don't you dare. You see, you're always looking for an advantage. Mm-hmm. 1%, 2%, 3%, 5%. Where do you get an advantage mm-hmm. from? Some people are just naturally smarter. But that doesn't mean to say they understand business. Mm-hmm. I think it was uh, Hugh McElvenny wrote an article on me many, many years ago, one of the great Fleet Street writers, who said, and I think he summed me up perfectly, Barry Hearn is equally at home on the board, in the boardroom as he is on the cobbles. Mm-hmm. And that mixture gives me a tremendous advantage against a lot of people. Yeah. Some people are roughhouses and, and physically and dangerous or whatever, but they're not as smart as me. Mm-hmm. Other people are much smarter than me, but they can't look after themselves. Yeah. So I'm in sort of in the middle ground. Mm-hmm. So whichever way the tide of business goes or the way the thoughts of the world are changing, I can adapt like a comedian. Yeah. So if you want me to be posh, you want me to be the really nice, up, I can do it. Mm-hmm. If you want me to be a rough house, I can do it. Mm-hmm. You just want me to be me, it's a mixture of the two, the normal person. But we're all playing roles, we're all acting, aren't we, to a certain extent. Yeah. And when you come out, I mean, I remember when I first joined my first major firm of accountants, I was a big success early doors. Um, they, I was their youngest ever audit manager. But they told me, this is as far as you go. Mm-hmm. Because the system that we're in place, which we're all fighting against systems at any stage, aren't we? Whether it's racism, sexism, whatever you want to call it, there's barriers to get through. Mm-hmm. And the barrier on that was that, that I hadn't gone to university, I hadn't come from a wealthy family, I didn't have any contacts and my family didn't have any money, so I was never going to be a partner. Mm-hmm. And you think, why not? I'm, am I good enough? Yeah, but that's not really the point. Well, it is the point. You know what's really interesting, Barry, on this point, a friend of mine uh, said to me just yesterday, tried to apply for a residency in Montenegro. Mm. The guy's a multi, multi-millionaire. He's been rejected because he's not got higher education. Really? For residency in this day and age. Tell him, just buy the country. Yeah. Cut out all yeah. the crap. It, there are barriers to entry for anything, you know, and there are still barriers. And the world is getting a better place, although there are still people that think it's dreadful, dreadful, dreadful. It's not. It's improving, but it's not the finished job yet mm-hmm. on any level. And we can't look history. We don't, history is history. It's consigned to history. We can't change history. Mm-hmm. What we can do is be better today. And that takes time. You know, in our time, there was that type of working class barrier. If you remember, I think, I forget, it was John Cleese, Ronnie Corbett, and somebody else. And it was, I'm upper class and I know my, I'm middle class, I'm working class. It's actually merging a little bit now. And it should be defined, as I define all my work in sport, as a meritocracy. Mm -hmm. So I'm not interested where you come from. Mm -hmm. I don't care if you're yellow. Orange, it doesn't matter to me. I'm interested to know how you can deliver. Now, that doesn't mean to say I will give you extra opportunity because you're a woman, you're an immigrant, you're disabled. No, it's a meritocracy. And that means you've got to prove yourself to me. And once you do, you're in the family, you have this protection and the arms around you for, all, for as long as you wish. Mm-hmm. It is difficult. 
you know, it's difficult because we've all got to evolve. We have to evolve as people, we have to evolve as a country, we have to evolve as a world, you know. So there's things to be taken into account. But in the early days, I found it a little bit of us against them, mm -hmm. as I'm sure other people in certain communities do as well. Mm -hmm. you know, so in a way, we've had that experience, so we should be able to learn from it. You were worried about this, weren't you? Because growing up, and you talk about this in the book, the, the posh kids, you wanted to kind of get in a bit of a scrap oh, with them. Oh, and then oh. obviously your, your, your own children have had a very different upbringing to yourself. So it's a whole different set of problems and challenges. I wouldn't have liked my kids you wouldn't like growing up. You wouldn't want to tell no, because <laughs> I had a chip on my shoulder. I think probably because my mum was such a snob and, you know, she was always pushing, you've got to be better, you've got to be, you have to work harder, you have to be better, you have to learn more. You know. And then you see the privileged kids, you know, you know, I mean, we walk to school, obviously. Mm -hmm. Other kids got, got to lift to school, you know, things like that. And, was, and they did speak better and they went to private schools and I, I had some issues when I was younger on that. Because the first thing they opened their mouth, I just wanted to whack them. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. And I've it, still got a little bit of that issue. <laughs> you know, in as far as when my son went to private school, there was a stage where I didn't like what, I didn't like his development. Mm -hmm. I didn't like what I was seeing. And fortunately, the DNA kicked in and I was wrong. He, he was a good man in, in an embryonic form. But you, you <laughs> just going to tell the listeners who haven't yet read the book, which of course you are going to go out and buy, um, the, the way that Barry did that was um, in the boxing ring, of course. Yeah. Well, I wanted to find out what type of kid he was. You see, are you a talker or are you a doer? You know, I, he was 16. He was a big lump. I, he was chatting, too much mouth, too lacking the discipline at school, too probably a bit of a bully because of his physical size. Mm. All the things I didn't like when I was growing up. And I wanted to find out what was the real, what's the truth. And I said, the only way really to find out is one against one, a proper fight. My wife went potty, you know. <laughs> but I said, no, I, I have to find out what I've got here because I've either got a disaster. No, he's my son. I'm going to love him, whatever he's like, of course. But I had a plan, you see. I think I upset my son a few years ago where I said, I said, I know you're my son, but you've really been my project. Yes. You know, and that's... He said, oh, thanks, Dad. Said, no, 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 take it as a compliment. And we went into the boxing ring, head guards, proper small gloves, gum shields, everything, and we had a proper, supposed to be three rounds, but he dropped me twice in the second round with body shots. I hate body shots. I don't mind being hit in the face. And, uh, but I think I left happier than him mm. because it proved a point. And subsequently I found out that I was wrong to worry, mm -hmm. that kids, kids are such amazing people, you know. I mean, there's no such thing as a kid that's born bad. No. The circumstance makes them bad. It's weird to blame the environment, the, you know, the establishment, whatever. But they've all got good in them. It's a question of have you got time to find it? Does the DNA kick in strong enough? And my two kids have had a very privileged life. Yeah. Private school, big education. They've had everything they want. And yet they've got that DNA in there that makes them work harder than anybody else, that takes them that extra mile, that means... Someone said to me the other day about Eddie, you know, do you think he'll, you know, is he getting too easy going, is he get? I said, this kid won't leave a tenner on the table. Mm -hmm. And that's not a criticism. That means, irrespective of what you do, where you come from, you do your job properly. You'll, be, you'll, you'll get through, you'll find out. But they have to have that attitude of wanting to win at all costs, whatever it takes to do it. Yeah. And there's certain circumstances in your life, certain approaches required, and there's other times when other approaches required. Yeah. And that is a blessing once you get that balance right. I think the story about the boxing just kind of epitomises your relationship mm. with Eddie, though, because despite the competitiveness, and you guys are like the world's worst, aren't you? You go yeah, at everything terrible. with 100%. You, you don't if we can maintain that in business, you see, I've always said when you take professional boxers, most of them come with not a lot of education, let's be honest. Uh, there's a few exceptions, but very few. They come from very working class. You know, getting hit in the face every day is not easy. So, you know, most people wouldn't put up with it, would they? You know, mummy and daddy will sort, you sort something out, but I don't have to do that. I think if business people had the same approach as professional fighters, 
with the sacrifices, the discipline, the lifestyle, the determination. I don't know how they'd fail in business. Mm -hmm. They need a bit of guidance, perhaps on just the edges, on the financials and things like that. But when I watch them, it's just the same, which is why I think that business and sport are so inextricably linked because the same rules apply. Yeah. If you really want to be a success, don't just talk about it. Do something about it. If you want to be a top boxer, you want to be a top athlete, you have to put the work in. You have to, or you're not going to do it. Mm -hmm. And people know that straight away. So if you've got the same approach to business, you will be a man, you will be a success, whatever. You know, and how big will depend on other factors like right place, right time. Well, there's a lot to unpack there and I want to go into that because I know you, you talk a lot about luck, but just, just going back to that competitive element and the fact that you do always put 100% in it mm. to, to the point where you literally give yourself nosebleeds because you do not stop. Regardless of that, you you and Eddie, like you're literally his biggest cheerleader, aren't you? And we were kind of joking before we hit record because all of his life, Eddie's been Barry Hearn's son. And the last couple of years, you you were sort of joking, so you walk into the boxing arena and people say, oh, there's Barry, Eddie Hearn's dad. Mm. And there's been that transition, but you absolutely love that. I think we've embraced it. And I think that's essential because the worst thing you can ever have, and I have seen it plenty of times with dads living their life through their sons, especially in sport, without the qualification of being a top trainer or whatever, you know, but they know what they want because they wanted it themselves. And you end up with a, a, a bad competition element where the father wants the son to do the things that he didn't do or, or to be better at something or, or not, sometimes not even to be as good as them because they can't stand the competition. Yeah. There has to be love in the room. Mm -hmm. And the love is be as good as you can be. be and that overflows into everything. I don't care what happens to my son, as long as he is the best he can be. Mm -hmm. And I'll take everything, whatever, because I'm his dad. Mm -hmm. And he's like that with me, you know. I mean, I'm still so competitive on everything, without any justification, because <laughs> frankly, I'm getting old. <laughs> but I still give 110%. So inevitably, you know, I get injured all the time. It don't stop me trying. Mm -hmm. But this morning, I texted Eddie last night, I'm injured. Bad this, bad that, bad that. He said, ice bucket for you tomorrow. I'll bring the ice in. So when we finish this, it makes everyone feel guilty at home, I will be spending probably 25 to 30 minutes up to my neck in ice water. That would make some great B-roll. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you want to see that. <laughs> but it's, what I'm saying is, we're inextricably linked in each other's success. Mm -hmm. So I am a fan of Eddie, and I know that I'm his biggest hero. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't, that's not said to be clever or bullish about, that's just a family. Yeah. And that's wanting the best for each other. Nothing wrong with that. Absolutely. Mm. Well, let's take it back then. You're one mm. of the youngest chartered accounts. You set up your own practice because you, you've went as far as you can as an employee. I, th I think I've read it in the book, you're on about £3,000 a month. Um, a year? A uh, year, not oh, a month. Oh, oh, a year. Yeah. Oh, yeah, of course, yeah. It was b b back in the day. Yeah. <laughs> and you were actually offered um, a position, a job, uh, yeah. £5,000 a year. And you said to them very categorically that Barry Heron is not for sale. Correct. And then, Absolutely. And then I'm saying total lie. <laughs> Uh, and of course, they came back and said, well, what about if we make it 7,500 a year? And I said, I'll start money. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, in a way, people know. And again, it's, it's the image you'll portray. And we're all our own self-publicists, aren't we? The way we act, the way we run our relationships in business and outside business. People know, over a period of time, they know, if they phone me, I know they have money. Mm -hmm. They want to spend money. So now it's a question of can I create something that's going to be of interest to them? But the first hurdle is already overcome. Mm -hmm. They're there, ready. I can only mess it up from that stage. Yeah. So when you do look at people's lives and the way it expands, we're governed by our parents, we're governed by our circumstance, and then it just develops during a period of time through experience and through different things happening at you. And that's where you find out how good you are. Mm -hmm. Can you cope with changing circumstances, good or bad? You know, I mean, we've all been through COVID, for Christ's sake. Yeah. I mean, 
that's the worst we've had. I mean, I've done, I think, three recessions, one banking crisis, and COVID. And COVID was the worst of a lot of them. But what I learned along the way put me in a position where COVID wasn't a problem. We had to be more creative, more innovative. We had to work a little bit harder. Yeah. We had to go beyond the boundaries. And we did. Mm -hmm. And we came out of it a far stronger business than we went in for it, yeah. which is another lesson to learn. Yeah. So, you know, no one's got every answer. No one's the smartest kid on the planet. Just be the best you can be. So you, you mentioned luck. And in this newly found role, so, so it's seven and a half grand a year. Yeah. You were in charge of, of acquisitions. You got mm. involved in a few things, property. Disasters. Um, I didn't know what I was doing on any level. At any level. These people trusted me. <laughs> you know, you're going to be the finance director in charge of, you know, new activities. We were in the textile business. It was it was like 60s and 70s time, you know. I mean, I walked into the building. I mean, I was... I had no experience of life. I mean, I'd qualified as a chartered accountant. I'm smart. I'm, you know, I can look after myself and all that. But I would go in there and there'd be men wearing makeup and the library would stink of marijuana. <laughs> I'd never come across anything like that. And I was the, the geek in the suits. But over a period of time, you adjust, you absorb and you learn, don't you, you know? And one thing I did was bought for them as an employee, I bought a chain of snooker halls and I bought it for the asset value of the snooker hall. But then I found out that God had other plans for me. And suddenly BBC were wall-to-wall -wall live snooker. And I started doing events, and my first events in 1974. Mm -hmm. And why did I do that? I did it as a business reason to boost attendances or create more interest locally. We had 20 odd billion halls around the place get the champions together. It wasn't rocket science, mm -hmm. but it may have been rocket science for someone else without that type of brain. Mm -hmm. And and then this tall ginger kid just knocked on the door one day and it was like a present from God. Yeah, hello, my name's Steve Davis. Can I play one of your competitions, Mr. Hearn? I went, well, you'll have to come here twice a week, son. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. Two and a half hours each week as yeah, well, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, from Plumstead, South London, three buses and a walk through the bridge. Um, over a period of time, it wasn't overnight, we became friends. I said, over a period of time, I realised this guy's a bit special. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, snooker was getting bigger and bigger. And I was in the right place at the right time, which a lot of people are. But it takes a certain type of bravery and a certain type of commitment to take advantage of that. Mm -hmm. And do you, do you go for it or do you talk about it? Mm -hmm. Life's full of old geezers in pubs that sit in a corner and tell you how the world should be. <laughs> I come, you know, you come out of the pub and do something about it, maybe you get more respect. Mm -hmm. Lots of people have got opinions on everything, some of which they know nothing whatsoever <laughs> about. And when I'm talking to them and they'll say, you know, my first question is, do you have a big house on the hill? <laughs> no, no, I live there. Okay, so your life has not really proved so successful yet commercially. Mm -hmm. No, but, so you know the way forward. I said, you know, I always wanted to be a brain surgeon. Would you let me operate on your brain? And they go, no, of course I wouldn't. I said, no, exactly. I'm a brain surgeon in my business. Don't tell me how to work my business. Unless you can come up with something. And I'm open enough to say, show me. Mm -hmm. Teach me. Yeah. Because most of them can't. But every now and again, something comes through and you learn from it. But adjusting to changing, changing circumstances, it's, it's fundamental to being a success in your own role. And have you got the vision yourself? Or do you settle for something? Do you settle for halfway? Mm -hmm. Do you say, like I could have done in 1982, I don't need to do anything anymore. I mean, I had a million and a half pounds in cash in 1982. I thought that was from where I came from. That's it. I don't need to do anything else. I can just, I can be a party animal. Yeah. Wrong. Wrong. So, so basically, what, what had happened, 1981, one of the opening scenes in the book, and one yeah. of the few occasions where you could not keep your emotions no, 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 in no. check, yeah, of course. it was the, the beginning of a whole new world for both you and Steve, yeah. wasn't yeah. it? When you sat there and, and watched through that was the That was the, the most important day or part commercially of my life. Mm -hmm. It changed my whole life because you can talk about things, but you have to deliver. So I was giving it the big mouth for years about this kid's going to be the greatest player, blah, 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 blah. But until he actually potted the pink against Doug Mountjoy to win 18-14 at the Crucible Theatre, 
in April 1981, it was just that talk. Suddenly we had the reality of having a world champion in a sport that was going gung-ho. I think you can argue snooker in the early 80s was bigger than football. You know, it was a time when there was a lot of crowd violence, a lot of hooliganism in football. Snooker was just getting huge, the hugest numbers. Yeah. And suddenly we had the best player in the world and I had the opportunity to sell the best player in the world and to develop a sport which I became quite passionate about. I mean, typical of me in sport is I'm always good at everything. I'm never great at anything. It's so <laughs> annoying. I think I'm great at the business side, mm -hmm. I hope, but I'm passionate about it. I would love to. All sports, all top sports men and women are my heroes, mm -hmm. shamelessly. I go, I mean, I'm literally stargazing mm. because I know what they've put in. I know the effort they've put in. I know they're special. So it makes them very special in my mind. Can, my, I, can I ask you something mm. about that? Would you give oh. everything up to be that heavyweight world champion boxer? I should say no, but yes. Of <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I should say no because... The longevity of my career puts in the shade any sportsman's career because they, they, they can't maintain it forever, can they? Mm -hmm. I mean, they have a sell-by date. But do you know when Anthony Joshua signed for us? Mm -hmm. He's quite – he's not so much now because he knows us well and he's like a member of the family almost. We love him. And he was very suspicious. You know, grey-haired, old bloke you know, wants to take over my career or whatever. Mm -hmm. And we were chatting and Eddie was fundamental in it, not me. But at one stage, Anthony just turned around and said, what, what, what do you really want from me? What do you really want? He said, I see, I see what you've got. I know who you are. What, what, do you, what do you want from me? And he's thinking in his mindset, I'm, he's just another commodity in, in a fast track world. And I said, I want 1% of your adrenaline. See, that's what I've always missed. You know, when I walk in the room with Anthony Joshua, if I'm walking in Madison Square Gardens, I'm walking in for a world title fight. And this applies, goes back to Steve. I felt a little bit of that rubbed on me. Mm -hmm. And I never had the ability for it to rub on me for the right reasons. It's like, Barry, you know, you're so good at this because no one's ever said that to me. Mm -hmm. But I'm involved. And that gave me 1%. And that's the 1% I can't buy. I can buy anything I want. Mm -hmm. What do I want? And as you get more older, you get more reflective. What do I really want? I'm 74. I'm, quite, I'm, I'm never going to be short of a pound note. What do I really want? And it's that adrenaline. And whether that adrenaline is playing, you know, low degree cricket in the Essex over 70s, or whether it's playing against Eddie for 50 quid, 18 holes of golf round, we're trying to kill each other. Uh, or whether it's building a business or launching a new sport or... That is the adrenaline. But the actual participation is another level. And that's why, regretfully, I'm weak enough to say I'll probably swap it all to be heavyweight champion of the world for one, <laughs> for one day. <laughs> for one day only. <laughs> I love that because you've been master of reinvention for, for over 40 years to, mm. to, to not just survive in business, but to, to thrive, to excel, to dominate. Yeah, really. What do you think has been the main driver in that? I think... Working class people that come out of certain conditions are always fearful of going back. Mm -hmm. You know, when you do okay, you sort of keep it close. I mean, I always tell everybody, and most of them sensible ones listen to me, when you're successful, first thing, first thing, pay your mortgage off. Mm -hmm. Why? Because you've always got a roof over your head. And that is really working class traditions because we're always frightened. As, yeah, we've, you know, we've done well. We've, we've had it off, as we might say, but we don't want anyone to take it off us. Yeah. So what do we do? We, I mean, a lot of working class families in the old days, maybe they buy a bit of gold and put it away in the wardrobe or something mm -hmm. like that. It's a rainy day fund, isn't it? Yeah. So that, after a period of time, it's, it's less likely. And, of course, there gets to a certain stage where, it depends what you want to do with your life and your money. You know, what I want to do is live another day. Pound notes come, pound notes go. Mm -hmm. I want to live another day. So I will push myself every single day and I will not take any notice of anyone who tries to be sensible with me. 
because I'm not going to be sensible. What do you mean by sensible? Take it easy, people. He's saying, take it easy. You've done it. Sit down. Do this, do that. Do you think I'm where I am now because I had that attitude? I could have taken it easy 40 years ago. Where would we have been now? Well, we'd have been okay, I'm sure. Family, I'm sure Eddie would have done great. Katie, my daughter's unbelievably talented on the yeah. television side. They'd have all been great without me. Yeah. They'd be bigger and better with me. And as a unit, you get so much more pleasure. And then now, all the worry now is on the grandchildren. Yeah. Oh my God, have they got the DNA? I phoned my daughter. I phoned my Eddie's girls the other day. So are you coming around to see Granddad? And one said, oh, I can't come on Saturday. I'm having a massage. Old? Nine. <laughs> and the other one said, I can't come. I'm having my nails done and a facial. She's 12. And I'm like, now I've got visions of Eddie, that, you know, those, that, that vision of Eddie growing up to be the wrong type of kid. And now I'm relaxed about it now because I think, you know what? That's the world. Yeah. Doesn't. Let's see if the DNA kicks in, and yeah. I believe it will. Yeah. And as, as I was worried about Eddie, and I found out that I had no need to worry, and so the same, and I still love them, and, and if they turn out good, bad, or indifferent, they're still mine. So that's all that matters. So, so let's go back a bit, because you're talking about the importance of mm. having that financial security and building the foundations and the mm. generational wealth, not just get rich quick or, or, no. or transactional, um, running a business in a more transactional way. But in 1982, you got the opportunity to basically sell the snooker halls uh, and you became a, a multimillionaire overnight. Mm. And you, you said in the book, which I thought was really interesting, that that was the first day when that money hit your account, that you'd not actually been overdrawn. Yeah. So, so obviously you weren't quite at the point where you were able to... No, no, to I think, well, I mean, I was earning good money. I had a good job, but I hadn't any financial... I still had mortgages and things like that. But the day that deal went through, I went down. I mean, I, I did things that I don't do because it, it was a unique day in my life. Mm -hmm. Suddenly someone gave me a cheque. I went down to the Ferrari dealer in Romford and bought a brand new Ferrari and never even negotiated a price. I just went, that one. Complete waste of money. Then I bought number three Grosvenor Street in London. Uh, in fact, Steve Davis and I bought it together. We bought half each. Uh, I paid £632,000 for that in 1980-something. Sold it later on when things got tough. Uh, and it's probably worth about 15 million quid now, so it was a good idea. Uh, I bought a forest in Scotland, yeah. which I enjoyed very much, next door to uh, Billy Connolly's forest, across the road from the Beatles and the Mallet Kintyre. So I used to sing a song every year. All these things had to go, and I bought this house. I bought Maskell's from the Ford Motor Company. It was their European president's home. Yeah. In those days, they had, and, and that was me done, you know. And there wasn't anything to do. I had the Romford Snooker Centre, which I kept for myself. I was running, uh, obviously, I had Stelka Stanite, which was a fruit machine business that ran the whole of the East End, which wasn't a particularly pleasant business, but it made money. So, I, job done. Mm -hmm. But job's not done if it's in you, you see. Mm -hmm. You know, this is, it's a business cancer in a way. You can't just go black to white in a day, you know, it takes time to soften and to see what you really want in life. You know, every day has been a blessing. So if I can maintain that attitude, then, then the success won't spoil me or us as a family. It, it will give us trappings of, of nice, nice things, which yeah. is sure, but it doesn't change our philosophy on life and also where we come from and keeping our feet on the ground. So the first thing we did when we started really organising that was getting the Matrim Foundation together to help things from our community, which we're doing more and more of as we, as we get more and more successful, frankly. Mm -hmm. And that's a legacy that is something very special to us, you know, and, and it's not something we want publicity or well done. It's nothing to do with anybody else. Mm -hmm. This is what we do. Mm -hmm. And that attitude is it's not a showcase. This is not an act. We are who we are, and, and some people don't like us. Mm. That's fine. You're entitled to your opinion. It's mm. not going to change my life. Mm -hmm. And if I don't like you, by the way, I will tell you to your face, <laughs> not behind your back. 
Because, I, you know, that's how we are. Does that come with age or have you always been like that? Little... I've always been a little bit like that. Oh, really? Yeah, I, I quite like it, really. <laughs> yeah. Especially if I really don't like them. It's just pleasurable seeing their face. I remember some Americans once tried to buy the business years ago and my wife said, what are you doing even, you know, do you need them? And she spoke some common sense. And I said to the guy, like, we're not going to do this deal. And he said, why? I said, because I, I just don't like you. Yeah. And he said, what's that got to do with it? I said, that's one of the reasons why I don't like you. Because it has everything to do with it. Mm-hmm. Who you spend your time, who you spend your life with, as they always say, it's no rehearsal, is it? Mm-hmm. So. It's really interesting, though, because you are a, a self-confessed um, workaholic. It's in the DNA. It's yeah. not, um, it, you know, it's just a part of who you are and yeah. as opposed to, to what you do. But in the book, you also mention that one of the happiest periods of your life was actually when you were kind of dossing around a bit and playing snooker oh. for 12 hours a day, which just, it, it just was that a, just a, a random little sort of blip that you I had think, to get out of your system? Or? I don't know. I mean, I just... I mean, I had a job, and and I, the, I was successful. I was the chairman of the company. It, it, I was in the right job, right place, right time, usual rules. And I was just at that age when just chill out, you know. It wasn't until I set myself higher targets. You know, you you have this this journey in life where I mean, obviously there's peaks and troughs, but you you try and level it out as much as you can mentally. So what they say, if you take adversity in the same way as you take success, you'll be a better person, you know, which is, I think, so true. But you're also governed by your own targets, you know, and it's like, I remember my dad coming home uh, when his money went up to £20 a week. It was like a family celebration. Yeah. It was like, and he was really, you know, I've been really happy. My pocket money went up from two shillings to two and sixpence a week. I was very happy as well. But that sort of personal target actually can also be a career setback for you because you sometimes you pitch your targets too low. Mm-hmm. I remember a friend of mine told me years ago, I asked him, I wonder if I can tell you his name, would he, would he be upset about it? He might do. But anyway, he's a very big player. And he, I said to him, Richard, his name's Richard Desmond. <laughs> we got it. Yeah. But he said, very, very skillful operator. Not everyone's cup of tea, but technically very good. I said, what's your, what's your target? We're having dinner one night. What, what, what are you in this world for? Because I see him getting more and more successful. He wanted to impress his mum, which I found nice, because if my mother had been alive, I would want to impress her as well. Mm. He said, I want to be a billionaire. He said, that, that would really impress my mum. And years later, we sat down having a dinner again, and I said, how you doing on the old billionaire approach? Because I said, I think that's a bit sad, putting a monetary value on something, you know? But I suppose we all do it in some way. And I said, how, how are you doing? And he said, um, ah, I pissed it. Much too easy a target. And I thought to myself, isn't that great? Isn't right. that great? So even at that level, sometimes you underestimate yourself. And some people just want to have a nice life. I mean, I always say, don't let's concentrate just on entrepreneurs. I mean, there are people out there that want to do a certain job, that have a calling. Mm-hmm. You know, some people want to be nuns, some people want to be doctors, nurses, mm-hmm. teachers. They all do fantastic things, mm-hmm. and that's their world. I don't, I don't criticise it. I'm not like that. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, don't criticise me. We all have our own targets. Mm-hmm. The danger for me at those early days was I probably thought, I've cracked this. Mm-hmm. The day you think you've cracked something is the day you go back. 100% because it, it wasn't all plain sailing. Obviously, that was that was the Absolutely. birth of, of Max yeah, yeah. But, you know, in any story of greatness, there's always well, the, there, there's always the setbacks. And you saw this huge opportunity. You're watching what was going on in the States. Yeah. At the time, we only had a couple of channels. We had very limited exposure to, to sport on television. You knew that that was going to change. And you wanted to be primed and ready to maximise that opportunity. And I was a few years you ahead of my time, yeah, to, <laughs> which to cost the, me a lot of money. But, but going back to something you said earlier so you talk about this in the book you you, you pretty much lost all the money that you had yeah. you, you'd previously made and, and owed the bank millions. a significant amount but you had bought assets yeah. you know you were never going to go fully back to the start you had mascots yeah. You, yeah. You, you had properties but it got pretty dicey and you said something in the book 
Um, in fact, I've got it, got it written down. You're like, I'm not here to share my problems. I'm here to solve my problems. Yeah, yeah. You had a snooker event in the January, which needed funding. People were completely mm. oblivious about the extent of your financial troubles. Yeah. It's Christmas Eve, mm. four o'clock. Dickens. This is, this is a Dickens story, it's, isn't it? It's <laughs> snowing. You're on your arse, basically. Yeah, you've, yeah. you've given up. You've mentally checked out. I think you referred to you're in the 11th round. You're, yeah. down, you're down on points. Yeah. You, you've got no um, no fight left in you. Your final appointment. Uh, your, your, your namesake as well. I think it was uh, Alan Heron as yeah, well. Yeah, no relation. No yeah. And uh, what, what happened then? I think it's... Uh... The first thing to say about that situation is there's times when you have to look at yourself in the mirror, which I do all the time. I have these weird conversations with myself in the mirror, you know, not every day, but every now and again. If I need to tell, tell someone the truth, if I need to hear the truth back, I know I can rely on myself. So when things are going well, we celebrate. When things are not going well, we celebrate. <laughs> So you keep it to yourself because those around you don't need to, maybe you've made mistakes, which I'm sure I did. Um, like, as you say, with the sports, I saw what ESPN was doing in America and said, this is only a matter of time. Yeah. I was probably two, maybe three years too early in terms of creating events and getting into that type of business before there was proper money in sport. That's the strength of it. Um, but, Looking back on it, had I waited that two or three years time, I wouldn't have had the start I had. So by the time Sky launched in 1990, of course, other things were happening in my life as well. Uh, everything suddenly looked rosier. But going back to that day in, I think it was the, the winter of, I'm going to say 88, something around that time, I was battered. I owed the bank millions. My wife didn't know anything about it because it wasn't her problem. Mm -hmm. The attitude is, if you're a proper proper player, you solve your own problems. You don't ask for help. You don't, you know. So I was going through that. I would have loved some help, by the way, but there was no one to give me any. So, And I had a, the Premier Snooker League, I think it was then called the European Snooker League, was starting at the end of January. I needed £300,000 sponsor and I didn't have one. And the whole country was in recession and no one wanted to spend anything. I had a good relationship with Lord Forte uh, and some people that worked for him. Um, nice, nice guys. And we'd done bits and pieces, but no one else was talking to me. It was Christmas Eve, by the way. Four o'clock, I got off a train at Slough Station. It started snowing. I, I mean, you couldn't write the script. It, looked, it was pathetic, really. And my heart just wasn't in it. As you say, like a boxer. I've been battered for the 11 rounds of the couple of years before. And... Whilst I'm always enthusiastic and always go the extra mile, sometimes there's a wall in front and you can't get through. I was as close as I could be to saying, do you know what, I'm a chartered accountant, I'm quite smart, I'm never going to starve, I'm go back into accountancy, get a job with Price Waterhouse, KPMG, whatever. I mean, you know, I'm smart, I know that. But I didn't want to do that. So I gave this pitch to this guy called Alan Hearn, who was the chief executive, and it was a terrible pitch. I mean, I could feel it. You know, I'm a salesman as well, you know, so I know when I'm buzzing and when I'm putting across enthusiasm and emotion and reasoning and and sometimes you think, God, oh, this is shit and it sounds like shit. And it sounds like shit to me. What's it going to sound like to And probably instead of doing 20 minutes, I probably did 12. And I'm, now I'm like, no, nah, this, is, this is just not for me. And I, I finished off and Alan looked at me and he said, you must really need this. He said, it's Christmas Eve. And I thought, you know, and the secret again is always tell the truth. Mm. I said, As I do, I really do. He said, well, I've got no money. So I thought, well, that's it, you know. <laughs> Someone, my corner has just thrown the towel in. And they've seen what's going on and no one deserves this. So take it like a, you know, a proper man. So I just said, Mr. Hearn, I appreciate that. Thank you for your time. Let me wish you and your family a happy Christmas, successful New Year. Turn around to walk out. And as I got towards the door, he said, but I've got hotel rooms. He's got my attention. I said, what does that mean? He said, well, I've got no money. I said, no, I got that bit. He said, but I like this. He said, 
but I can't give you £300,000 in cash. I'll give you £300,000 in hotel rooms. Well, at that time, Lord Forty owned Sandy Lane in Barbados, Plaza Athene in New York, uh, Georges Sank in Paris, Waldorf Hotel in London, top quality. So that 300000 was real, you know, in value. And we shook hands on it. And on the way back from his office to Slough Station, I sold a lot to the people I knew in the travel business who trusted me to be able to deliver. And, and I gave them a 40% discount. And they gave me £180,000. And that £180,000 not only saved my company, it saved me. Because it proved to me, you're walking back, you look in the mirror and you go, you've only gone and done it. You've only gone and got out of the deepest mire ever. How have you? And it's Christmas Eve and it's Christmas with the kids. And all of a sudden, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. And it's not a train coming towards you. And it was a statement of character that has never left me. And that was the most, business-wise, probably the most important part of why we are what we are. Because we don't accept defeat. We got bloody close, frankly. And we've never been that close since. And since that day, we haven't had a year. I'm going to say we haven't had a year where our profits haven't grown. That's not quite true because we have, we were probably 25% down in COVID years, two COVID years. But we've had year-on-year year effective growth since that day in 1989 and that's something special and of course sky came the next year eubank became a superstar television was saying to me we need events because there's not enough events to go on the hours we have to fill mm -hmm. and suddenly baza was the flavor <laughs> de la month <laughs> it's such a nice story though because you said in the book that that was the last day that you ever doubted yourself yes. and you know, there is so many you, know, you said before there are so many similarities with business yeah. to, to yeah, sports yeah. And, uh, i've been finding this as well i've interviewed a few elite special forces as well i'm just obsessed with the mindset the attributes it takes to get to, mm. to that level of success and how many times have we seen using the boxing an analogy mm. of a, a boxer going the distance you know that they're going to lose on points they, they're yeah. absolutely filled in but they keep in the fight and they manage to get that the heavy or whatever. Sometimes it, it can happen and sometimes it's not your day. But if you're not in the game, you've got no chance yeah. to win, have you? So the secret of everyone is don't it, you know, there won't always be good days. That that life doesn't work like that. But what you do is you take everything out of each day. So you you may make them a good day for different reasons. You may say, Well, I lost that, but I learned a lot. Mm -hmm. You know? Or I lost that, but I earned a lot. Mm -hmm. So all of those things means that it's how you interpret your life and your day and what you're prepared to give. And I think sometimes, you know, when you talk to an athlete, I mean, you talk about someone who say, can you take 10 minutes off your marathon time? I go, no, I'm the best I can be. Not true. It's because you haven't, you haven't tried it, mm -hmm. really tried it. You've tried it 98%. There's two more percent to go. And it's that mindset in business where you say, is this the best your company can be? Because I'd have settled for what I was 10 years ago, 20 years ago. I'd have been, I'd have been happy, really. But there was always this temptation to look and say, I haven't got this right. Am I missing out on something? And it's a game. This is what I keep saying. Because everyone looks and goes, oh, you've got a few quid. You know, you walk in, oh, Bazza, give us, give us a few quid. No, no, no. I'm playing a game. There's noughts on this game. That doesn't matter. When Steve Davis was playing snooker, he never knew the prize money of any event. That's the one. But he wanted that trophy. And he knew if he got that trophy, it came with a big check. Yeah. But he didn't want to go into that fight knowing. Only once, I remember Steve played in the Yamaha Organs Trophy in Derby, and he missed the pink to win the game. Straight, dead straight pink. He subsequently won the game anyway. And I said to him afterwards, what was going on with that pink? That was all over. We could have been out of here half an hour earlier. He went, it was 10 grand first prize, he said, wasn't it? I went, yes. How do you know that? He said, someone told me. He said, and I got down on that pink and all I could see was 10 grand. Mm. I missed it by eight inches. <laughs> yeah. So you don't think of that, you know, but that's just a technique. It doesn't happen overnight. You know, you have to educate people. 
And as I say, sportsmen and women fall in the same category. That pushing yourself to a level you never expected. I didn't mm. expect that Matra was ever going to be one of the biggest sports promotion companies in the world. Don't be ridiculous. I come from Dagnum. What are you talking about? Did, did you have <laughs> any sort of coaches or mentors? Because what you saw, or even confidants, because what you've described is almost quite a, for such a larger than life character, you're a man of the people, but you're almost mm. describing something that's quite a, a solitary journey. Yeah, it is. Because you, the, the, the good times and the bad times, you take full responsibility for everything, which is clearly one of the attributes of success. But um, I can imagine when the weight of the world is on your shoulder, that that could be, should you allow it, that could be quite a, a lonely place. I mean, I think it's difficult to say you've got heroes because I think that's probably wrong. You, you've got people that you think you've got it right. You can learn from people in some ways. And we're all such a mixture of things anyway, but probably Warren Buffett has been quite an inspirational, I've never met him, by mm -hmm. the way, but I've studied him and I've seen what he does and how he values management, how he values people, and how he stayed, sounds ridiculous for a man who's worth so much money, how he stayed quite normal mm -hmm. in terms of he still lives in the same house he'd lived in 40, 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. You know, that lovely story, unfortunately his first wife died and she was a philanthropist and Warren wasn't. And in her memory, he decided he wanted to be and phoned Bill Gates and said, I'd like to help with your charity. And Bill said, you don't really do charitable work. And he said, well, I'm going to start now. And he sent him 30 billion, yeah. you know. So things like that where people learn through their life but start off with a core it's like building a house. You know, you build a house, you've got to do the foundations right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm a chartered accountant for 50, over 50 years. I'm very proud of that. And it's part of my foundations. I was brought up properly by my mother and father initially, but mainly by my mother. And that laid another foundation. But I wanted a nice indoors. So I got a little bit, you know, I want to see reward for my endeavour. But then I understood there was a commitment to make. And then I look at great people like like a Warren Buffett. As I say, I've never met him, only know of him. I like the way he kept his feet on the ground. I think that's important as well. And suddenly the house is decorated and, you, and you're putting a decent roof on it. But you're building a roof that can actually if necessary, be taken down. And you might put three or four more stories on. Mm. I love that. And you also talk in the, the book as well, and it's not dissimilar to Warren or, or any of the greats, really, anyone who's achieved anything, but you do have to have that singular focus mm. above all else. Yeah. You have to be selfish. That's the reality. It's yeah. the, the, yeah. the analogy of you've got to put your own gas mask on before you put yeah. the yeah, person yeah. next yeah, to yeah. you. And well, that's what do they say in an aeroplane. Yeah. You know, if, we, if, we, if, we, if it drops in, do yours before it, because you can't help anyone else. Mm -hmm. And that's actually a really good analogy, really good, because it's all about your family as well, isn't it? Yeah. You know, when they say, you were, you were horrible for five years mm. in, the, in the mid to late 80s or something like that, yeah, but you didn't know the price I was paying at that time. Mm -hmm. And I was doing that for the greater good. Mm -hmm. But selfishly, I was also doing it for myself and I think you need a level of selfishness, which sometimes doesn't look good. But that commitment, that commitment to the cause and to say, I'll take this on my shoulders. I don't need to involve anyone else. Mm. I'm a big enough person to do that. And by the way, when I get through, when I win eventually, as I always will, then I will use that for the greater good. And that's part of the fun because it's not monetary. Mm -hmm. It sounds terrible when you say... And you can imagine poor people, your people suffering, in, which is so many more people are doing it today, suffering in today's economy. Mm -hmm. they ha it must sound terrible to say, well, it's not about the money when you've got a load of money. Of course, you yeah. can say that. But actions speak louder than words. So what do you do with it is much more important. And if you're just going to fly off to a tax haven and live your short-term, artificial, superficial life, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> Because I'm staying here where I came from. I'm paying every penny of tax. I don't care. I can remember my dad saying, paying tax is good. Yeah. The more tax you pay, the more you've earned. I thought, that makes sense. So let's just go and pay more tax. Yeah. And that 
you know, benefits everybody, hopefully. But selfishly, I want a good life for myself because I, I make sacrifices that other people didn't make. Exactly. And I went the extra yard when other people faltered. So, but it's it really, the, the legacy will be, what have you left? What have you, you know, and I, my legacy will be certain sports where people have changed their lives. And I think I've made a good contribution to that. And that's changed other people's lives. They've also changed my life. Profit is the most important word. Yeah. People don't like profit. Wrong. Profit gives sustainability. Yeah. It's a bit like, you know, we've got a conservative leadership on the moment. Do we cut taxes? Do we not cut taxes? Morons. Sorry, Rishi. Do not cut taxes. You have to cut taxes. Mm -hmm. You have to stimulate growth. Of course, it's got to be in a controlled environment. You don't let it go willy-nilly. But history proves that you actually benefit more by attaining growth. You know, yeah. then, and that's for everyone's benefit, not just those. But of course, I appreciate we don't want people making a load of money, then running off and not paying their tax mm -hmm. and all that sort of stuff. That we can stop that, well, but you have to go for growth. Was there ever, was there ever a moment when you thought, "I've made it"? Not in terms of you want to stop, but just yes, I'm successful. I have that moment every morning of my life. Every morning. Wow. I walk around, I go, I talk to myself all the time because <laughs> no one else will listen to me. <laughs> I mean, I've been hours waiting for, to find a podcast that would actually take me. <laughs> I walk around and I go, Baza, you are bang, add it off, son. Add it off. I'm untouchable. The only the good Lord. This is why. Give me an extra day. All I want is an extra day. So what contributed towards your decision to step down right time, as chairman? Right time, right place. It's terribly difficult to do. I'm trying so hard and I'm failing a lot. Eddie sort of tolerates me, but I keep putting my nose in because I do know a little bit about the business we're in. Uh, I think most of my senior people understand that, that Bazza's just always going to be there. Mm -hmm. um, but we restructured the company. The kids have got more shares than me now. I don't need it. Well, well we can't eat money. Um, but I think I just got to the stage where COVID was probably delayed a decision. I probably might have done it. I mean, I'm, I might have done it a little bit earlier. I think the management's ready. That was the other thing. I wanted to make sure these people that have joined Great success stories in their own way. Mm -hmm. You know, kids that joined us at 16 and our main board directors. Mm -hmm. People that come out of university and local newspapers and main board directors. And there are others aspiring to be main board director. We know both men, women, everything. It's, it is a meritocracy. Show us what you do. And we have, I value people on three criteria. Number one, how long have you been with me? Because loyalty is the most important factor in anything. Mm -hmm. Number two, how much money does your department make? Because if it doesn't, where do I get my sustainability from? Mm -hmm. Number three, what extra have you brought in that I never anticipated? Mm -hmm. That's the key one. Show me. Can you show me you've got my, don't expect you all to have my genes in your body, but can you show me that you have plans to make this company a better place? but maintain the ethos of the smiling face and the sound of laughter. So powerful. Mm. Well, what do you think of the direction that sport is going in at the moment with the likes of your Jake Paul and Logan well, no. Paul? Well, listen, and all those, it's it. a changing world and that's one of the reasons why. I mean, you know, you've kindly, and this is my last plug for this book, you've kindly mentioned my book and I'm desperate in competition with Eddie. I want to sell more copies than Eddie. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> uh, but I'm going to lose. It doesn't, even though you know you're going to lose, it doesn't stop you giving 100%. Mm -hmm. So I am out everywhere. I'm, for the first month or so of this book, I was everywhere doing everything. And then I realised, of course, that Eddie's got over 2 million social media followers. I've got no positive chance, you know. <laughs> but it don't stop me giving, putting up the best fight I can. You don't win every fight. But the same principle applies about being the best you can in every fight. Mm -hmm. So I don't swallow. I don't give up, no matter what. And I shall continue the good fight. I shall keep saying to Edward, you know, your book is going to outsell me, but it is a comic in comparison to my book, which is a classic. 
<laughs> so you just have to, I'm trying to get some benefit out of it somewhere. <laughs> Well, it's not over till it's over. If anyone's demonstrated that, um, many years this is true. This is true. I think I'm, my my book will sell for many years because it's a. I think it's an interesting book. It took me three and a half years to do yeah. seventy hours of tapes while I was fishing, but I enjoyed it. Yeah. And the only reason I wrote the book in the first place was because my daughter said she had twin boys when she was forty. She said, "I want you to write your book, Dad, because I want my boys to read about you when you're not here, mm. and they can understand a little bit about more about." the family ethos and, and the rules of the family, which is why I wrote that little letter to him, which is at the end of the book, saying, these are the rules of our family. Mm. And, and of course, they all think granddad's mad <laughs> because they're not going to read this letter. If it's stuck on their wall, mm. over a period of time, they will read it, that mm. your handshake is the most important thing. It is better than contracts. There's some rules as well. And by the way, kill or be killed, you know, you've got, you know, don't want you growing up having your massages at nine. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right for fun, but the attitude is when you go, you have to make a contribution. And I, I think I'll be fine because I think the genes will kick in again, as they did with Eddie and Katie. Love that. Penultimate question for you. I could literally talk to you for hours, but penultimate question. Anything that I've not asked that you wish I'd have asked you to do? It's very difficult because I'm so spoiled with uh, happiness. So <laughs> whatever you ask me, yeah, I mean, you 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 do what you do, and you're good at what you do. You could ask a thousand things, and there's a thousand different things. I mean, I think we don't want to really talk about religion, but but I'm fairly religious in terms of God. I believe in destiny. Mm -hmm. I believe in fate more than the significance of a celestial body. Mm -hmm. I just believe there are rules, uh, and I think. The good guys win. Is it Bob my life's been like one of the old cowboy movies in black and white? I used to pay sixpence on a Saturday to go and watch. <laughs> Is it at the end? The good guys always win, don't they? Mm. And that's the story of my life. The good guys. And people say, oh, are you saying you're a good guy? The answer is yes, I am actually. Yeah. And if you don't agree with me, you're entitled to your opinion. By the way, it's an opinion I won't be listening to. Don't, I won't tell anyone, but it's the most challenging sports person you've ever Oh, seen. there's loads of them, loads of them. Because, because these people with exceptional ability are in their own way sporting geniuses. Yeah. And as with Einstein through to Warren Buffett or whatever you want to say, they're all geniuses. By the way, one day people might write that I'm a genius as well. Mm -hmm. So I'll accept all that. But we're all different, aren't yeah. we? And if we weren't different, we wouldn't be geniuses to start with because mm. geniuses see things from a different approach to normal people. So Ronnie O'Sullivan can be a bit of a pain sometimes on the snooker circuit, mm. but he's a genius. Mm. So you give him rope because you don't want to lose the genius. Alex Higgins was a complete nutcase, mm. but <clears throat> he was a genius. And you don't, I don't want to lose geniuses. That's what makes my world so exciting. Mm. They're not going to be easy people. Mm. I think my wife is probably a genius. Mm. But she's not easy either. Yeah. But, you know, would I still be with her after 52 years if she was normal? Probably not. Mm. But she's not normal. <laughs> and nor am I. No, so you want to be. <laughs> when you look, when you look at everything and say Eubank Senior, for example, boxing, you know, we were so close. I, I mean... But I'll never forget, I was his best man at his wedding and he made a major contribution to my life, probably second only to Steve Davis. Mm. You know, we're coming out of the bad times of the late 80s and suddenly I had a world champion when he beat Nigel Benn in 1990, changed my whole world again. Suddenly I was a big player. Mm -hmm. And you know, I look at all these other people and I realise competitors. Mm. I love competition. But I realise they're only, they're the humans. Mm. You know, most of them are fur coat, no knickers. <laughs> you know, they've got yeah. all the show and none of the dough. Mm -hmm. And they haven't got that long-term legacy feel that I always want to see in the business. You know, I've, I've, I'm vain. I've got an ego. I want to be successful. But I also want my sports to grow, which shows me how successful I am. Yeah. So when I see darts, starts off with £500,000 of prize money for the year. Yeah. And at the moment, it's 16 million. And I'm thinking, they're all happy. I'm not. Mm. I want it to be 20 or 30 or 40 million. I believe I can make darts into working men's golf globally. Mm. Without all these issues of snobbishness, just a meritocracy. 
I don't care, as I say. I don't care where you came from. Because I didn't expect anyone to care where I came from. So, how good are you? Show me. And you will be rewarded. And so you should, because God has given you a talent. And then you look at snooker and say, snooker's bigger now than it's ever been worldwide. It's not as big in the UK as it used to be. Where else in the world do we go? When do we stop and say enough's enough? And the answer is bloody never on my watch. <laughs> Any regrets? <laughs> regrets. <laughs> do you know what? I mean, people say that. I can't think of a bigger waste of my time, which is so precious to me, yes. than to look backwards. Why? What do I hope to achieve by looking backwards? <laughs> Making myself feel miserable. <laughs> Saying, oh, you should have done that, but oh, you weren't so smart as you. No, I compartmentalise, mm -hmm. I dispatch. Mm -hmm. You know, you go on a toilet on an aeroplane. You know when you press the flush? Mm -hmm. It's gone, I don't know where it goes, mm -hmm. but it's gone. You don't have time to regret. You live in planning. You live for now and you plan the future. It's a total, of course, you've learned lessons with failures, etc. And mainly you learn about people that let you down more than anything else. People are very prone to let you down. It's okay, it's human nature. Don't spend a second of your life looking backwards. You write off, you flush the toilet, you move on. And that's the way you don't live in the past. My, I have lots of people around me say, oh, I should have never done this. I would never, ever say that. Whatever was done was for a reason. We move on. But you don't spend time on things you can't change. You spend time on things you can change, and that's the future. So powerful. Final question for you, Barry. I'm slightly, slightly saying penultimate, and asking you about three questions. Final, final question. Name of the podcast is On a Mission. What's your mission? What's the legacy? Mm -hmm. Legacy sounds a bit snobby, really. You know, it feels it sound, makes you sound a bit too self-important. You say, I've got a legacy. But inevitably, you must have one. Because mm. if you haven't got a plan, as the A-team says, nothing is as good as when a plan comes together. I suppose the legacy is to be remembered, you know, and to be gratefully remembered. That sounds a bit pretentious. My legacy would be people just, when they talk about me, they do it with a smile on their face. Because I don't want to take myself too seriously because I'm not that important. In the bigger picture, we are little specks, aren't we, on this great world? Mm -hmm. But we live in the greatest country in the world. We should appreciate what we've got and try and make it better. Mm -hmm. And that probably applies to my business as well. I think the sports business is the greatest business in the world. But it can be better. Mm -hmm. So we should do our best to make it better. Barry, thank you so much for your time. I have absolutely loved every second of it. It's been packed with value. I know the listeners are going to love it. You're an absolute superstar. We're going to need to come back. I'm just going to keep coming back to Maskell's for periodic podcasts. At least I've got someone to talk to. If I, in my lonely days, I'll be here for you just waiting. This is, you know, this happens every time, Barry. I always have a list of questions and I don't ask any of them. So we'll never <laughs> have a follow-up. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. This episode is brought to you by Red Light Finance. Red Light Finance is on a mission to bridge the gap between the real world and Web3 using blockchain technology. You too can power your business through Red Light Finance's gasless blockchain. With the cost of living crisis, we all need a little bit more extra income in our pocket. Red Light Finance offers blockchain solutions, passive income, gaming and so much more. I've personally been investing with Red Light Finance since day one and I'm hugely passionate about the project. For more information on how you can get involved, visit www.redlight.finance. Thanks again to Red Light Finance for sponsoring the On Your Mission podcast.